So we're talking about is man good or bad? And um, as I said, it's a, a debate that's been going on for many years. And uh, I wanted to share with you the words of a philosopher of the 17th century who had some thoughts on this. And he argued that natural inequalities between humans are not so great as to give anyone clear superiority and thus almost live in constant fear of loss or violence. So that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war. And such a war as is of every man against every man. So this philosopher argued that the job of governments was basically to tame this warlike instinct in us humans and to restrain what would otherwise be a constant state of anarchy, every man at war with every other man. Well, a couple of centuries later, uh, writers challenged that view and uh, somebody called Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the famous writer usually associated with the French Revolution, he had a different point of view and uh, this is what Wikipedia says about him. Hobbes's view was challenged in the 18th century by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who claimed that Hobbes was taking socialised people and simply imagining them living outside of the society in which they were raised. And he affirmed instead that people were neither good nor bad but were born as a blank slate and later society and the environment influenced which way we lean. So his view was that society and the environment of our lives is the thing that makes us the way we are and that was his view. And then a much more recent psychologist has used a traditional story to illustrate his idea. And uh, this was in a book that he wrote called The Psychology of Genocide, a man called Stephen Baum. And uh, he's re retelling a, an old Indian tale of a grandfather teaching the principles of life to his grandson. And he writes that a fight is going on inside me, he says to the boy. It's a terrible fight and it's between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, and so on. And the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, and so on. And he says the same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. And the grandson thought about it for a minute, and then he asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. So there's obvious wisdom at the heart of that story, isn't there? But the basic idea from it is that there's potential for good and bad in each one of us, and it just depends on the path that you take. And even more recently, in, on a website called Psychology Today, an article was written a couple of years ago, and it was in, entitled The Nature of Man. Is man by nature good or basically bad? And this was the conclusion of the article. The obviously correct answer to the question, is man good or bad, is that both are very true. Man indeed is wonderfully good, caring and creative. Our species is an incredible leap forward on the evolutionary scale. Yet simultaneously man is one rotten manipulator, exploiter, abuser and killer. So the answer for this writer is that we're both good and bad. But it's this final quote that to me reveals the problem. And the problem with all of the opinions that I've quoted for you is that they all basically assume evolution. They assume that we are in a godless world. And these writers, even the earlier ones, basically believe that mankind simply emerged from a more primitive existence. And then since Darwin, the idea of chance mutation and a natural selection was how it happened. Basically the survival of the fittest. And here's the problem with that when you think about it. You begin to realise that under that view of the world, even morality itself begins to crumble because the concepts of good and bad actually start to have no meaning because if humans simply evolved then who's to say what's good or what's bad 
if we as a race have simply climbed to the top of the evolutionary tree through natural selection, through survival of the fittest, and in order to survive, presumably our forebears must have fought and scrapped their way to the top of that tree, then who's to say that behaviour is either good or bad? By whose standards would such a fight be immoral? It was simply what our ancestors needed to do to stay alive and to reproduce. So why couldn't that be seen as a good thing? Just look at the violence that happens in the natural world to see that this natural explanation um, would lead us to who knows where. Just think of the animals and how they, they fight and scrap for survival. If that's how mankind is seen, then what is morality? And for me, it's quite ironical that the, the most vociferous and the, the campaigning atheists, they tend to be the ones who are also most morally judgmental uh, about the so-called evils of religion. So there is a better answer. And what I'd like to do is, if it works, um, just play a very short clip from a debate between Richard Dawkins, who's that famous atheist who wrote the book called The God Delusion, and an Oxford professor of mathematics, a man called John Lennox. And here in this clip, John is making this very point about uh, morality and um, probably putting it rather better than I could. So um, let's see if we can play this clip and see if you can get a hold of the point that John is making in this, uh, in this debate. We may need to wait for a second or two to, to make this work. Let's just see. Them. So I want to suggest this, that far from atheism delivering an adequate explanation for morality, it dissolves it. And it's a problem that's been around for centuries. How can something mindless and impersonal like the universe impose a sense of morality upon us? And David Hume, a philosopher whom you quote, pointed this out very clearly. He said, you just cannot get an ought from an is. You cannot derive morality and ethics from matter and energy. You cannot go from facts to values. And what concerns me greatly is that, although you don't say it in your book, is that this kind of philosophy that has no base for morals in a transcendent God has got to find morality either in raw nature or a combination of nature and society and often leads to a kind of utilitarianism. And we are in serious ethical confusion, I think, in our contemporary world, in the legal uh, sphere, in the ethical, in the medical sphere, and in the business sphere, because the foundations are crumbling. And I want to suggest, I know it's provocative, but I want to suggest that Dostoevsky was very perceptive, and I've had many Russians agreeing with me, when he said, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. He's not saying that people can't be good. He's saying that the foundations of morality are removed. And Nietzsche predicted exactly the same thing. So I find that trying to get morality elsewhere is, is something that is doomed to destruction. I would love to spend time discussing the Bible. I think your view of the Bible is a bit one-sided. There are things there to be discussed. We're about to turn to it. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, so that clip finished with a reference to the Bible. And, and that's what we're going to do for the rest of our talk now. And there is a place that we can turn for answers, and it is in God's Word. It's not to the writings of, of clever philosophers who really can only speculate, but to the Bible, the word of God. And Christadelphians believe that the Bible is God's word. We believe it was written by men, but the words themselves were given by inspiration of God. They were given by his power. And our faith in the Bible isn't blind or, or without evidence. 
there are lots of good reasons to believe that the Bible came from God, like fulfilled prophecy or archaeology or its consistent message or its remarkable preservation or its wisdom and many other reasons. And we do give talks about those subjects from time to time. But this evening, I'd like us to take for granted that the Bible is from God. And we'll see what it's got to tell us about this question of is man good or bad? So let's see, first of all, that it does, in fact, claim to be God's word. And uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So it claims to be God's word given through his power. Now, I'm sure you'll agree that if you look at human history, we do see that men and women are capable of a bewildering mixture of both good and bad. They can be wonderfully creative or they can be horribly destructive. So, for example, uh, man-made spacecrafts can push out into the universe and, and currently there is um, a man-made machine on Mars looking at that planet, for example. Man-made devices are also able to travel along the tubes and arteries of our bodies or we can scan the, the minute complexities of the human brain and, and find ways, ways to heal. So wonderful things. But on the other hand, man-made machines are also capable of leaving countless dead people on the battlefields of human history. So history is full of, of stories about human heroism or human brutality and evil. So how is it that from the same human source such wonderful and such repulsive things can come? Well, the Bible does give us the answer. And in the opening words, it describes to us both the origins of human life and also the reasons for this sort of dual personality that we have. So we're going to have a look at uh, Genesis and Genesis chapter one, the account of creation. And I do know that people do find difficulty with that. But the Bible isn't a, a science textbook. It, it doesn't try to set out every scientific question about life. But that doesn't mean that it's not also a true account. It doesn't mean that it can't be trusted or that it doesn't give us facts about how life began and what the first man and woman were like and what they did. So let's see what it says. Well, here are the opening words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness so the Bible tells us then that God was the creator that he spoke and, and things came about his spirit or his power brought about the world and as soon as the fourth verse there you notice that it says here's the comment that it was good and how could it have been anything other than that? Of course, God had created something that was good, something that was a reflection of his own goodness, something that would be capable ultimately of reflecting God's glory. And so day after day for six days, we read that God spoke and he brought into existence different aspects of the creation. And a total of seven times in all in this first chapter in Genesis, it says that God said that what he had made was good. Seven is often thought to be the, the complete number. And on the last occasion, in verse 31, it actually says, behold, it was very good. So everything that God made was very good. And this included the man and the woman, the male and the female, Adam and Eve. And so the Bible is clear, good. That's the condition in which the human race started. But this first chapter tells us more than, than just that. In uh, verse 26, it says this, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. 
male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea. So there are extra details there. They were created in God's image and likeness. They were blessed like the birds and the fish in verse 22, and, and they were given dominion over everything else. So the man and woman clearly were special. They were different to all the other creatures. And even today we use the words image and likeness. When we talk about a son or a daughter being like their father or their mother, we might say something like, oh, he's the image of his father or she's got her mum's likeness. So what does it mean to be in the image and likeness of God? Well, just notice that it's used in the plural, isn't it? God said, let us make man in our image. And if we go to Psalm 8, which is a psalm of David, and he's reflecting upon the wonders of God's creation, this is what he writes. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For well, thou hast made him a, a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and has put all things under his feet. And you can see there the connections, can't you, with Genesis, that reference to dominion. So although David may also have been talking, looking forward to someone, it does seem to me that he's also looking back and connecting with, with Genesis. And it seems that God's angels are included in that phrase then, let us make man in our image. So God made Adam and Eve like himself and like his angels. But here it, it says in the psalm that, they were lower also, deficient in some respects. Now, if you read through the Bible, you see that on many occasions, angels do appear to men and, and they do look similar. They look like men. In fact, sometimes they're referred to as men, although sometimes they also shine with God's glory. So likeness doesn't just refer to appearance. It, it does become clear that God wants much more from the man and the woman than he does from the other animals, the other creatures. So they must have had the ability to worship God, whereas the other animals didn't. Clearly they could understand God, what he said and, and how he wanted them to behave. They could think, they could put those thoughts into speech, they could pray to God. And they could believe him when he made promises to them. So they were free to choose whether to respond to what God wanted or not, to obey him or whether to turn away. Now, none of the other animals could do any of that. So in this unique way, then, it seems to me that they were like God. They were like the angels. And so they were then created at the very beginning good. In fact, as we read in verse 31, very good. But was there any difference from the angels? Remember what the psalmist said, that man was made lower than them. Well, in Luke chapter 20, um, there's a verse here that clearly tells us that angels couldn't die. Um, it says, uh, talking of, of believers, actually, in the, in the kingdom and the promise of immortality, it says, neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God. So Jesus was talking about immortality being promised to his followers, and there's no mention anywhere that Adam and Eve were created with immortality like the angels had. So that's the at least one reason and one way in which they were lower than the angels. We are, in fact, told how Adam and Eve were created. And uh, the next chapter tells us about Adam, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God combined together dust and breath, and he created Adam a living soul. There's nothing here about immortality. It, it doesn't say that he was going to possess a soul, but that he was going to be a living soul. And Eve was later created from Adam's side, and together they were in the image and likeness of God and the angels. But they weren't immortal. If they had been immortal, then they wouldn't have died, and we do read that they die. So Adam wasn't fearful. He wasn't afraid of death. 
he was put into that beautiful garden, the Garden of Eden. He was given dominion over the animals and he was able to enjoy a lovely life, carefree. And it seems he had great potential and great freedom. But at the same time, it also seems that he was immature, both morally and, and spiritually. And so Genesis goes on to tell us the way in which God chose to develop them both and their characters and their, their maturity. They were going to be tested. Now, at this stage, Eve actually hadn't been made. But in chapter two, we read this. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden that thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge and good of, uh, of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So he could eat of any tree except one. And Adam must have explained that also to his wife Eve. And it's clear that God wanted to develop them. They were going to be given a choice as to whether they were going to obey him or not. And he wanted a sign from them of their love towards him, a reflection of, of his own love to them, his own character. He wanted that reflected back. So was this law going to be enough? Well, as we read through, it seems not, because the test perhaps wasn't going to be real unless Adam and Eve could really understand an alternative, unless they could be challenged with a different point of view. And the following chapter, which we read, explains how God made that challenge real for them through the serpent. And it says, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, yea, God hath said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So here was the other point of view. Here was the challenge then to God's authority, the temptation that would make the test personal and, and prove the character of Adam and Eve and how are they going to respond to this well we read on the woman said we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God had said you shall not eat of it neither shall you touch it lest you die and the serpent said unto the woman you shall not surely die so this was more than just another point of view this was a blatant contradiction. This was a lie. God hasn't been honest, said the serpent. You won't die. So who are they going to believe? Were they going to believe God or this creature who could speak and reason? Now, there's lots of fanciful ideas about this serpent. Some people suggest that it, it was the devil intruding into God's paradise garden. But Genesis doesn't say that. In fact, it seems pretty clear when you think about it, that it, it must have been one of the creatures that God himself had made. It was just another beast of the field, as verse one says. It wasn't a fallen angel or a supernatural demon. There's nothing about that forcing its way into the garden. This was part of God's plan. This was how he knew he would be making the challenge for Adam and Eve real. And so the serpent continues then for God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you'll be as gods, known good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So the decision to eat was theirs. The serpent had offered them wisdom and knowledge, offered them the experience of good and evil and they could choose whether to love and obey the Lord God, their creator, or whether to listen to the serpent. We know what happened. The, the man and the woman succumbed. They chose to believe the serpent over the Lord God. And, and that's the point at which everything for them changed. This was actually the devil at work, not a supernatural being, but the, the temptation to disobey that took hold in the minds of Adam and Eve. The temptation was there. This was a tree to be desired to make one wise and it looked great and, and it worked on her and eventually she took of the tree. So the Bible does use the imagery of a, of a devil 
uh, it uses the device of personification to illustrate that natural process of temptation that goes on in the mind. The taking hold of, of a wrong thought, which then leads to sin. So we read then that man started off so very good, but now had fallen into temptation and sin. Uh, and what follows in Genesis helps us to find the answer to our question. Is man good or bad? God said to them that they would die if they ate. The serpent denied it, but God, of course, was true to his word. So it says in verse seven, the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Something had changed. Their disobedience had brought fear and shame and they wanted to hide from God. They wanted to cover up their nakedness that they were now aware of. And their sin clearly had caused a separation from God. And as God spoke to them both, they tried to shift the blame, but that wasn't going to work. Adam was, in fact, more to blame than Eve because he was the one who first received the commandment. He's the one who God first spoke to and said, Adam, where are you? Why are you hiding? Adam was the one to blame. And so we read unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So sorrow and struggle was going to be his life. And one day he would die. He would return to the dust. That was going to be his fate, his punishment. They were no longer very good. And since that time, then we only have to look at the record of, of human history to confirm the flaws that now exist in, in human nature. Mankind is capable of wonderful feats, but no one is able to achieve that total obedience which God looked for in Adam and Eve. And so much of what we see in human history is so painful and so evil really well actually somebody was able to achieve it and we'll come back to that at the end somebody was in fact able to obey god in every way but what does the bible tell us about what happened because of adam's sin well in the new testament now as paul's writing to the believers in rome he says this by one man, and he's talking about Adam, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for the all of sin. So he's saying because we're all descended from Adam and Eve, then death and mortality has passed on to each one of us. And, and Jesus spoke very plainly about what's inside each, each one of us. He said, in Mark chapter 7, that which comes out of the man, that which defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, pride, and blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So human nature does produce these bad things and history confirms that. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can try and do something about it. And we can struggle against that basic nature that seems to be inside us now since the fall of Adam and Eve. And um, the Apostle Paul talks about it in his letter to the Romans in chapter 7. He recognises that struggle going on inside him as he tries to serve God and the Lord Jesus, but so often struggles. So in verse 18, he says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, 
dwells no good thing for to will is present with me i want to do that is right that, that which is right but how to perform that which is good i find not I, I find it difficult i can't do it verse 19 for the good that i would i do not but the evil which i would not that i do that's his nature now if i do that i would not it is no more i that do it but sin that dwelleth in me he's saying it, it is my nature that i've inherited from adam that causes me to be like that and he says i find then a law that when i would do good evil is present with me for i delight in the law of god after the inward man there is a part of him that wants to do god's will that spiritual mind within him that believing mind but i see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin which is in my members so he's talking about that battle that's inside each one of us who is trying to follow the lord jesus to love him and to love one another that really sums it up to love god and to love each other but because of our nature we find that so hard it's a bit like those wolves in the tail but there is a way out and this is how paul finishes this chapter oh wretched man that i am but who shall deliver me from the body of this death i thank god through jesus christ our lord so then with the mind i myself serve the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin so he says who shall deliver me from this this problem and the answer comes i thank god through jesus christ and that is the answer so i'd like to finish by going back to genesis because the answer was actually given to adam and eve right back there when this problem first started in in genesis and chapter three and we read in verse 13 the lord god said unto the woman what is this that thou hast done and the woman said the serpent beguiled me and i did eat and the lord god said unto the serpent because thou hast done this thing thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel and this promise then is the answer to paul's dilemma the serpent in the bible does come to represent sin and god said that there would be enmity a battle between sin and the descendants of eve but he says that one of those descendants her seed and he's talking about one because he says it one of your descendants, Eve, is going to bruise the head of the serpent. He's going to inflict a fatal blow and destroy the serpent to destroy sin. But at the same time, the serpent or sin is going to bruise that descendant on the heel. A wound, but not a fatal wound. So right back at the very beginning god knew that he was going to provide the answer to the problem that had been created by the sin of adam and eve and the answer is his son the lord jesus christ jesus who was indeed born of a woman but not born of a man because god was his father jesus we read in the bible was going to give his life on the cross and by doing that, he was going to crush sin and destroy death for those that put their, their love and their faith in him, ultimately because of the hope of resurrection. But in doing so, he would be temporarily bruised on the heel. But that bruise would be healed after three days when Jesus rose from the dead. And, and that's what this verse here in genesis chapter 3 is pointing forward to so is man good or bad well 
let Jesus give us the answer in Mark chapter 10, where he says this. Um, somebody came running and kneeled to Jesus and said, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There is none good, but one, that is God. So even the Lord Jesus, who lived a perfect life and never once sinned, he recognised that he too was descended from Adam and therefore he was mortal. And because of that, he was flawed in the same way that each one of us is. We're, we're tempted to sin as Jesus was. And yet the hope of the gospel is absolutely clear. And that's given to us at the end of the letter of Jude. And I'd like us to finish with this. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Saviour be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So the message of the Bible is that if we believe in the Lord Jesus, if we respond to his call by being baptised, then through his sacrifice and, and through his resurrection, we can have our sins forgiven. And we can be invited to have a place in God's kingdom when he returns to the earth. And at that day, we will indeed be faultless and we will be given immortality to live forever with him. So we do invite you to look further into these wonderful things and to read the word of God for yourself. Thank you.